Okay. Mike, so, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, I was uh, really spent my formative years in Michigan in a Dow Chemical Company uh, headquarters town, a uh, town called Midland, Michigan. And um, the emphasis in the high school and so forth was around science and there was a lot of interest due to the fact that there were a lot of uh, chemists there in science. So there was positive feedback for that, but I always had an interest uh, in how things worked and, you know, what was the basis for, uh, you know, everything from the refrigerator to you name it, uh, and loved the books on how things work, uh, and, you know, reveled in those, and going to the museums, uh, mostly in Chicago when I was young, uh, Museum of Science and Industry was uh, a great place to go and see, you know, what were the workings of everything, uh, in a wide variety of ranges, so. Yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit about what was that major spark that you had that, that made you decide that you'll take up science as a career? Well, as I say, I was always interested in aspects of it, and uh, what my father was, uh, being a chemist, you know, obviously had experience in that, and um, he was involved in creating compounds that were then commercialized. And he was admittedly somewhat disillusioned by that process. Uh, he was complaining about the fact that it took 10 years or so from, from an idea to really see it out as a product and felt that uh, something like medicine would give much more instant gratification. So it was always pushing me to go into medicine. And uh, in the end, what decided things for me was that I was always interested in understanding how things worked rather than the engineering or practical implication of uh, dealing with a patient on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I, you know, went to a hospital and worked in a hospital over a summer on the night shift and that enabled me to see what was involved in becoming a doctor. And there were a lot of aspects of it that uh, just didn't seem to fit with me. And then much more interested in the lab and, you know, posing questions and trying to answer those with experiments and so that was the deciding issue for me in the end. So you had a long career in science moving from different places, different countries. Can you trace a, trace a path for us? So basically I started out in the Midwest in, in the United States and as an undergraduate was doing research uh, in a chemistry lab and then went to Argonne National Labs for a semester of research there, just measuring uh, in a very physical chemistry, high temperature chemistry process, very esoteric. Uh, and then went to Caltech uh, as a graduate student in chemistry where I was doing nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy of uh, membrane lipids and uh, we understood there the, the effect of curvature on the organization of the phospholipids and uh, that was my thesis and then I went to work with uh, John Singer uh, at the time he was uh, had just formulated this fluid mosaic model of how membranes were organized. And we then, uh, and my postdoctoral research was on really how do you shape the red blood cell. Uh, it seemed that there were dramatic changes in shape when you added compounds that bound to the lipid water interface and those that bound to the outside half 
of the red cell would cause the cell to crenate or get spicules, whereas those that bound to the inside face of the membrane caused it to invaginate. And this led to uh, Singer to postulate the uh, bilayer couple model. It seemed trivial to me at the time, and uh, we did a number of scanning microscopy studies to show that it was working and that the, uh, the basic premise was true. And so, uh, and it received a lot of press and certainly has been widely quoted and uh, uh, referenced since that time. But to me at the time, it seemed like a very obvious issue. Okay. Uh, from there, I went on to uh, start my own faculty position uh, at the University of Connecticut Health Sciences Center. So my concession to my father was that uh, I would work in a medical set school rather than uh, in pure basic science. Uh, and the problems there were, in, again, following up on uh, this sh change in shape, uh, leading to the understanding of uh, protein interactions with the surface of the membrane, which led me to uh, get involved with actin and myosin. And then I went on sabbatical. Uh, in after about five years there and very quickly in that sabbatical worked out a method for in vitro uh, measurements of myosin contraction which then led to involvement with Ron Vale and we went to Woods Hole and collaborated with Tom Reese and Bruce Schnapp uh, on the discovery of kinesin another motor that moved uh, material around in cells. And uh, from that time, I've been interested in mechanical questions and uh, moving back and forth between membranes and, and the actin and uh, microtubule cytoskeleton. So, so there's a huge uh, interest in people to go to translation research. And as a high school student or an undergraduate student, it's always mind-boggling that uh, the loss of uh, the direction that one can take uh, is is, uh, is made meaningfully towards translation. Can you give your insights on why basic research is still very important? Well, the I mean, the short answer is that you always need something to translate. Uh, the longer answer is that, indeed, the fundamental understanding of processes and how things are done uh, is extremely important in terms of uh, that application and that ultimate, uh, you know, translation. Okay. Uh, point uh, in question, for example, is that many of the processes that we're dealing with of, you know, malformations due to genetic malformations or due to disease or to cancer, we fundamentally don't understand the basic processes that underlie those normal shapes and much less the abnormal shapes that are developed. Okay. And it's not a trivial issue uh, and involves many changes in the cell-cell and the cell matrix interactions to drive those. So there is a major need for greater fundamental understanding of these processes. And if we try to move to a situation where we're just giving a drug, expecting an outcome, uh, the success rate is very low and we just don't understand uh, you know, what's happening and we can't then take more complicated approaches by, for example, you know, mechanical manipulations followed by or in the presence of a drug can potentially have much more of an effect than simply the drug alone. 
So there's a lot of trend in recent times that uh, we're losing students uh, not entering basic science, not choosing science as a career. Uh, do you have any ideas, suggestions for that? Well, I think the there is certainly uh, in both biology and physics um, a diminishing frontier, so to speak, in terms of fundamental new concepts that you know might be on the horizon. Do we really need to understand something uh, fundamentally new, and are there uh, lots of fundamentally new things to be discovered? And the general answer is that it's certainly less than in our father's time. However, the issue that I would say is most important here is that the students have the background and training in the basic sciences to enable them then to understand how various applications and various uh, implementations can occur. So, in other words, the limits are often defined at the basic level. Understanding those limits and understanding those basic fundamentals are critical for now fully exploiting and taking advantage of uh, what can be done in producing some new product or in new applications. So, more recently, the world is a flat land for students to choose scientific careers. What would be your suggestion in terms of the landscape where one works? Uh, in the U.S., it's been a, traditionally U.S. has been really strong in the sure. and now Europe is quite strong and Asia is growing. Uh, what would be your view for a, a student? I mean, I think that um, at the undergraduate level and even the early graduate student level, the emphasis and uh, really has to come from the student. Okay. In other words, if you're interested in understanding the fundamentals of how something really works and what are the basic processes, you can do that uh, in a small college in the U.S. as well as in a, a major university in Europe or uh, in Southeast Asia. The tools are there, the textbooks are there, and, and you know, looking at it in depth and raising these questions doesn't require you to go to Harvard or MIT. Okay, You can and often people who come out of those institutions feel, feel, have a feeling of entitlement or privilege or, uh, you know, if nothing uh, less than arrogance, that um, doesn't help them well. Because the real solution to problems comes in the interest and the effort to solving them. So with your tinkering outlook, you are the co-discoverer of kindness and motors, uh, which is so fundamental for all our people. I ask the advice for students entering science, what is the best working model for us? Is the tinkering model better? Is it a well, I think uh, being curious and engaging are the important things. Okay. I mean, often the students come with this question of, should I go into this area, should I go into that area, what, what really should I do? And the defining element in, uh, should be what you're really passionate about. Okay. If you are passionate to the extent that you do the work and really exert yourself, most areas are open to you. Okay. If you don't want to you know, work that hard, if you want a nine-to-five job, then there is reason for you know, 
directing yourself down a path which is one got commercial opportunities and, and so forth. However, um, often you find that people make those sorts of decisions uh, for the wrong reasons. They are not enthusiastic about what they're doing, hence they don't do it well, and they don't realize that commercial success that they were hoping for. So uh, I think it has to be for success in large part driven by what you're really passionate about. Great. Thanks, Mike. Sure.